Hey guys, welcome back to another lecture video for Chem 115. In this lecture video, we'll continue our discussion of titration curves. Uh, more specifically, we're going to learn how to perform calculations when our titrant is a strong base and our analyte is a weak acid. And so let's go ahead and start by going through um, an example. And so the main goal of today's lecture video is once again to determine the pH of the solution uh, when the volume of the titrant that's added to the analyte is some amount. And finally, we're going to take all of our results and we're going to create a titration curve. We're going to sketch a titration curve. So whenever you guys are performing these types of, um, whenever you guys are working with these types of problems, the first thing that you guys want to identify is what substance is the analyte? What substance is the titrant? And so we're going to go ahead and, and use very simple common clues that's in the problem that'll help us um, identify which substance the analyte and which substance is the titrant. In this case, the sample is referring to the hydrofluoric acid. And so this hydrofluoric acid will be considered our analyte simply because that's a sample that we're going to put in to our Erlenmeyer flask. So this is the substance that we're trying to analyze. And notice that it says it's titrated with. And so sodium hydroxide must then be our titrant. Um, and so unlike the past uh, uh, few videos I've made for um, titration calculations, um, we've kind of gone ahead and taken for granted that we just have an acid and a base. However, um, once you start going through these like mixed problems, not all of these acids are strong acids. Not all of these bases are strong base. And so when you're working through these types of problems on your own, you really need to identify whether or not the substance, the, the analyte that you're, that's in your sample is going to be a strong acid or a weak acid or a strong base or a weak base. Because um, that first identification uh, will gear you to perform a certain, a certain uh, set of calculations to determine the pH of that solution. And so um, hydrofluoric acid, we see that its Ka value is given to us, and it's 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4. And so since that Ka value is far less than 1, we're going to go ahead and conclude that HF is a weak acid. We can also make that conclusion if we know the list of common strong acids, and hydrofluoric acid is not one of them. Now, if you guys are looking at the uh, titrant, sodium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide is a strong base. Okay? It's found on the list of common strong bases. And so what you're doing here is you're titrating a weak acid to that or with a strong base. Okay? And we're going to see that our calculations are going to differ just um, uh, it, our calculations will differ compared to strong acid, strong base, or strong base, uh, strong acid titra titration. All right, so we're going to go ahead and um, summarize all the important uh, values that's found in this paragraph. So here we have a 25 milliliter sample of this specific acid, and we have this concentration of our titrant. And so I went ahead and uh, drew a burette, and underneath this burette is our Erlenmeyer flask. So I simply summarized all of the information that I highlighted um, on this image. So I have a 0.2 molar concentration of sodium hydroxide, and I have this volume and this concentration of hydrofluoric acid. And so let's go ahead and look at our first uh, uh, let's go ahead and look at our first problem. 
we're going to calculate the initial pH of the analyte. Okay. And so once again, um, I always encourage you guys to draw pictures for every single one of these steps, just so you can kind of visualize what's happening. And so since we're trying to calculate the initial pH of the analyte, um, this is implying that there is no titrant added. We're simply taking the solution, putting in Erlenmeyer flask, and determining its initial pH, its pH. And so if you look at the identity of uh, our titrant, this is going to be a base. And so we're going to say that VB is equal to 0, 0.00 mils. Now, if you want to determine the initial pH of the analyte, um, we're just trying to understand how hydrofluoric acid is uh, acting in water. Okay. We're not doing anything to hydrofluoric acid. We're simply allowing it to do its thing in water. And so when we place uh, hydrofluoric acid in water, um, we know that some fraction of that substance is going to ionize, producing H+. Plus and F minus. And so if you want to figure out the pH of the solution, what we need to determine is the initial, I'm sorry, the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen ion. Well, if you guys look at the equation that I just wrote down, the hydrogen ion is found here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the ice table to represent you know, the overall progress of the separation of hydrofluoric acid into its individual components. And so here I have the initial um, amount or concentration, the change, and the equilibrium. Okay. Oops. Jot of this meter. All right. So here I've I've gone ahead and drawn my ice table, and we're going to go ahead and um, place the initial concentration. Now, uh, you have to keep in mind that there's no acid base reaction occurring. And so since there's no acid-base reaction occurring, we can go ahead and place this 0.200 uh, zero, zero molar directly into the initial concentration for hydrofluoric acid. Okay. So we don't need to convert it into moles. We don't need to recalculate the concentration. Uh, just because we have... Um, Nothing, we're not really doing anything to this value, right? There's no reaction that's occurring. And so very similar to what we've, what you guys have gone through at the very beginning of this chapter, you need to figure out the equilibrium um, concentrations. And so you need to identify what the change is. Okay? Now, hydrofluoric acid, remember, it is a weak acid. So unlike our last uh, two examples in prior videos, the change in the weak acid, the change for a weak acid, uh, we don't know, right? We don't know how much of it will ionize. For strong acids, strong bases, we do know. It's the whole thing. And so uh, in this scenario, you already see some differences in terms of calculating the initial pH between strong acid, strong base, and weak acid, and weak base uh, as well. Uh, what we do know is that it is going to produce some ions of hydrogen ion and fluoride ion. And the expressions for each of these substances at equilibrium is going to be 0 0.200 minus x, plus x, and plus x. Okay. And so everything here is going to be aqueous in state. And so, therefore, we can go ahead and build a mass action expression, an equilibrium law, for the ionization of HF. And since 
um, we're ionizing hydrofluoric acid if we're looking at it in the forward direction it's supposed to represent Ka okay. and some fraction of it will uh, <clears throat> will go back to become HF but uh, for now the ionization in the forward direction is being represented by Ka so therefore our mass action expression should simply be Ka is equal to H plus raised to the first power because the coefficient is 1, 1, and 1, times this by the concentration of F minus raised to the first power over the concentration of HF raised to the first power. Now, uh, all we need to do is just plug everything in and solve for x. And so at the very beginning of the problem, it told us that the Ka is 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4. And so I'm going to go ahead and plug that in. So 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4 is equal to okay, x, x. And this whole thing is going to be right over here. So x times x over 0.2 minus x. And so if we um, combine or multiply those two x values, we'll get an x squared. And once again, uh, we're going to go ahead and see if we actually need this x. Um, and so hopefully by now you guys will know how to prove this. Uh, you want to determine if the initial concentration is far greater than the K value times 100. And so um, 0 0.200 is greater than 7.2 times 10 to the negative 2. And so we can't ignore this. So 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4 is equal to x squared over 0.2, zero, zero. And so if I multiply this to the other side and then take the square root of that answer, okay, so it's going to be 0.200 zero, zero, times this by 7.2 um, times 10 to negative 4. Okay. That's going to give me the value of x. And so I'm going to take 0.2 times this by 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4. And the result is going to be 1.44 times 10 to the negative 4. I'm going to go ahead and take a square, uh, I'm going to square root that answer. And the value that I get is going to be 1.2 times 10 to the negative 2. Oops. And so this x is going to represent the change. However, if you uh, were to look at our ice table, not only does it represent the change, it also represents the equilibrium concentration of H+, plus, which is what we want to solve for at equilibrium so we can determine the pH of the solution. And so um, if the concentration of hydrogen ion at equilibrium is equal to 1.2 times 10 to negative 2 molar, we simply have to take the negative log of this value to get the pH. Okay. So the negative log of my answer now, since I have two sig figs, I'm going to, I'm going to report two places after the decimal. So the, my pH is going to be 1.92 when no volume of base is added. So this is going to be my starting point. And I'll go ahead and highlight these two. Um, just to represent that that's my final answer. Okay, So 
just a little bit more calculations um, that's involved to calculate the initial pH of the analyte. Um, however, this uh, calculation should be nothing new to you since this is the first thing that we uh, discussed in this lecture video series for this chapter. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the second problem. And I'm also going to copy this image. So that way I don't have to keep on scrolling up, looking at what the values are um, and all of that stuff. Okay, so we've, I've reset the image um, for part B. So let's go ahead and start our calculations. And so once again, we're looking for the pH of the analyte. After 10 mils of titrant is added. So in this scenario, we are adding 10 mils of sodium hydroxide. And once again, sodium hydroxide is a base. So we're adding a base to an acid. So this is going to be an acid-base neutralization reaction. So the first thing I'm going to write is my chemical equation. So hydrofluoric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide to produce water and sodium fluoride. Now, if you guys recall from earlier lecture videos, we know that sodium is a spectator ion. It will not affect the pH of the solution. So we can go ahead and ignore this. Also, uh, we know that fluoride, um, oh, you know what, let's just go ahead and leave, leave, like, leave it f like this for now. Um, and so fluoride is the anion of, the weak, of a weak acid. And so since it's an anion of a weak acid and not a strong acid, we need to go ahead and keep it in our equation. And you'll see why. And so the, to summarize what's happening here, we're going to have this weak acid reacting with hydroxide, which is a strong base, to produce our water plus F minus. Okay. So please do, do not exclude the fluoride because that anion is an anion of a weak acid and it will affect the pH of the solution. Whereas, uh, for example, if you, have a, uh, if you have sodium chloride, NaCl, Cl or chloride is the anion of a strong acid and therefore it will not affect the pH of the solution. All right, so since we are um, performing an actual chemical reaction, very similar to other problems that we've done in previous lecture videos, we're going to go ahead and create an ice table. Um, and once again, the, the reason why we're creating an ice table is to um, kind of quantify the progress of how much substance we have initially to that of how much we have at the very end after the reaction has occurred. And so keep in mind, just visualize this, this, this reaction. We're taking 10 mils of sodium hydroxide and we're placing it in 25 mils of this hydrofluoric acid. So of course a chemical reaction is going to occur and we want to summarize the progress of that chemical reaction by using an ice table. And since everything, since a reaction is occurring, my, the perspective that I want to look at is through, uh, through moles. I don't want to use molarity 
Um, I mean, I can, but I would have to recalculate the, the molarity of each component and then put it in my ice table. Uh, I just have my own way of, of doing things, um, but you can perform either technique and both techniques will yield the same answer. And so for me, it just makes sense to just get everything in terms of moles. Um, so we're going to go ahead and convert 10 milliliters in to liters. And so that's going to be 0 0.0100. 0. I think there's another zero here. So I'm moving this decimal place three times to the left to convert milliliters into liters. <clears throat> now I'm going to take that volume and multiply it by its molarity to get the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Or more specifically, since I cancel out sodium in my chemical reaction, it'll just uh, represent moles of hydroxide. Now, if I multiply those two values, um, I will get 2.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of OH. And so I'm going to go ahead and place that value as the initial no moles. in my ice table. So this is how much I'm actually adding in to this Erlenmeyer flask. I'm adding 2.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Now let's go ahead and look at uh, our weak acid, hydrofluoric acid. Similar situation, we're going to con uh, multiply, convert the milliliters to liters, and then multiply by molarity to get the number of moles of HF. And so I have 0.025 zero zero liters right so once again i'm converting that into liters multiply that by the concentration for every one liter that's 0 0.200 moles and in this case i do need to write hf because they are not hf is not a strong acid and so uh, the h or the f minus is not a spectator So when I multiply those two values, I'm going to get 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of HF. And so I'm reporting everything in terms of scientific notation. If you guys get calculator answers, that's in decimal. Um, it's the same thing. It's just expressed in a different fashion. All right. So now that we have the initial moles, um, does this problem indicate that we have, uh, you know, fluoride ions initially? Okay. And the answer to that is no. Um, even though we do know, even though we 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 do know that there are some amount of uh, fluoride ions that was produced in the first step. Um, we're actually treating each problem. So here, since x is 1.2 times 10 to negative 2, uh, this does represent the amount of fluoride ions at equilibrium um, for our initial pH. However, what we're doing is we're treating uh, this problem as if, uh, as if it was new. Like, we're not building upon the previous uh, part. All right, and so what we're going to do next is we are going to um, figure out which one is going to be completely consumed and which one is going to remain at equilibrium. <clears throat> and so since the magnitude is the same, we're just simply looking at the numbers. And so in this scenario, we're going to go ahead and subtract 2.00 times 10 to the negative 3. That's less in amount than 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3. And whatever reactant we consume, we also produce here. 
even though for water, we know that we're going to ignore it in our mass action expression just because it's liquid in state. Okay. Now if you add downwards, notice that all of this will cancel and that's going to be zero. And if you guys uh, add downwards, we just get 3 times, or 3.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of HF at equilibrium. And at equilibrium, we have 2.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of F minus. And so now that we've figured out um, the equilibrium amounts in mole units, uh, we need to think about what we're trying to address. We're trying to address the pH of the solution. And so to determine the pH of the solution, we need hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions at equilibrium. Right? Either one of these will, get, will, determine, will help us determine the pH of the solution. Now, if you look at the components that we have, do we see H plus alone or OH minus alone at equilibrium? The answer is no, we don't. So how do we determine the pH if we don't have H plus, if we didn't tabulate H plus or OH minus? Now, this is um, going to take just a little bit of of skill and recognition, but remember that HF is a weak acid. And if you add a strong base to a weak acid, much like you guys saw in our buffer preparation calculations, what do you produce? Well, the F minus would be the conjugate base. And so whenever you have a weak acid and it's conjugate present in the same solution, okay, so I'll write it down here, weak acid and it's conjugate base in solution, then what you get, what you have is a buffer. And if you have a buffer, you can go ahead and use the henderson hasselbalch equation. Oops. Where the conjugate base is in the numerator and the weak acid is in the denominator. And remember that um, the values that goes into this parentheses can either be in molarity, moles, or one per liter based on previous calculations in prior lecture videos. And so it's okay for us to leave this in terms of moles. Uh, we don't need to convert this into molarity. Um, and so here in this case, the pH and so the henderson hasselbalch equation helps us determine what the pH of the solution is. And all we need to know is the pKa and the ratio of the conjugate base to the weak acid. And so it's going to be 2.00 times 10 to the negative 3 over moles over 3.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles and notice that the moles will cancel out, um, which once again highlights the fact that we can use any type of unit for molarity because they're just going to cancel each other out. And so if I divide those two values, I get 0. 0.666, there's a whole bunch of sixes. Um, and then in, if you round up, it'll be 7. And if you take the log of the answer, you get negative 1, um, negative point 
one seven six. Okay. And so the pH is equal to the pKa plus negative point one seven six. Now, does it make sense for our answer to be negative? Well, let's look. Uh, it turns out that our weak acid is going to be more prevalent than the conjugate base. So what that's telling us is that um, our pH should be lower than the pKa. So it does make sense for our value to be negative. And so to determine our pKa, uh, we just need to remember what our Ka value is and then take the negative log of it. So our Ka is 7.2 times 10 to negative 4. So we're going to take the negative log of 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4. And that answer is going to be placed right where the arrow is pointing. So negative log of 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4. And what I get is 3.14. Okay. And if I subtract that by 0.176, I get a pH value of 2.97. And so after adding, uh, after adding 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, this strong base, notice that the pH went up uh, from, oops, our pH went up from one point. 9 to 2.97. Okay. And so um, this is going to define our second point in our titration curve. All right. So let's go ahead and look at the third question. So we did this, we did this. Now we're going to calculate the pH of the analyte when the volume of the titrant is exactly half the volume needed to reach the equivalence point. Okay. Um, so once again, we need to determine the pH. However, the scenario is a little different here. We want to determine, uh, we were not given the volume of the titrant. We have to figure out what the volume of the titrant is. And it's telling us in the problem that the volume of the titrant should be half the volume needed to reach the equivalence point. Okay. And so VB for part C, the volume of the titrant needs to be one half the volume of the titrant, VB, for when it reaches the equivalence point. Okay. So to solve for this, we need to solve for this first. Um, and so to determine the volume of the base, or the volume of the titrant, at the equivalence point, we're going to use that very special equation. Remember, we can only use this special equation when we are at the equivalence point. And that equation is MA times VA over NA equals to MB times VB over NB. Okay. And so since we're trying to determine the volume at the equivalence point, I need to plug in values. 
It represents the molarity, the volume, and the number of moles of acid, as well as the molarity and the number of moles of base. And so um, if I were to look at, I'm just going to go ahead and copy this, this image once again. I'm going to erase some stuff here because this image contains all of the information that I need to solve my problem. Uh, right now it's just masked in a lot of side notes. Okay. All right. And so the molarity of the acid is going to be 0 0.200 molar, okay, right here. The volume of the acid is at 25 mils. And the molarity of the base is going to be 0 0.200. And the volume of the equivalence point is what I'm looking for. So that's going to be my x. Now for Na and Nb, um, that's coming from the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. And that one again, that equation once again is HF reacting with sodium hydroxide to produce water and our salt, sodium fluoride. Okay. Now if you balance the entire chemical equation, you'll notice that this is a one to one to one to one ratio. It's a monoprotic acid to a monoprotic base. So it sh the values should be 1 and 1. All right. And so I'm going to go ahead and rewrite my work just to clean up what I wrote at the top. Now if I solve for x, notice that the two concentrations are the same. So for me to reach equivalence point, I need to add 25 mils. Okay. So this is the equivalence point. And so if my equivalence point is 25.00 mils, we're, uh, for part C, we're not calculating the pH at the equivalence point. We're calculating when we add half of the volume required to reach the equivalence point. And so therefore, that value for part C is going to be 12.50 mils. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So to get that 12.0, 12 12.50 mils, we need to determine the volume at the equivalence point first. And we did that by using the modified version of the dilution equation. All right, now that we have um, the volume, we're going to determine the pH when we have uh, exactly half the amount that we need. And so um, now that I know I have, um, now that I know that I'm placing 12.50 milliliters into this flask of sodium hydroxide, once again, where a chemical reaction is occurring, right? Very similar to part B. And we're going to go ahead and um, measure the pH by creating an ice table so that we can summarize what's happening in the course of the reaction. And so we're going to create another ice table. And I'm only going to do this once for this type of problem, just to, just to prove something to you. But when you guys get future problems like this, you can actually streamline your calculation by making an assumption. And I'll tell you what I'll tell you that assumption. Um, after we do this problem, okay?
Now, um, I know that my sodium is my spectator ion, so I'm going to go ahead and completely erase that. And I'm just going to get hydroxide with a negative charge and a fluoride with a negative charge. And my water is going to be liquid in state. Everything is aqueous. Um, and so since a reaction is occurring between an acid, between this weak acid and this base, uh, we're going to go ahead and describe the change in amounts by calculating the number of moles. And so if you guys calculate this, so this is um, <clears throat> 0.2 times this by 0 0.025, that's going to give us 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. And so the amount of um, acid that I have, or weak, or weak acid that I have, is 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Now, if you do the same thing for the base, okay, if I convert the volume into liters, so that's going to be 0 0.01250, and then multiply it by the concentration, which is 0.2, I get 2.50 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of the base. Okay. So hopefully you guys understand where I, I grabbed those numbers from. It's very similar to my calculation in part B. And so since, since a reaction is occurring, we have to think about you know, how, uh, how the reactants are going to be consumed. And so since we have a lesser amount of, of hydroxide, uh, the magnitude is the same. However, 2.50 is less than 5. So therefore, all of the base is going to be completely consumed. So all of this, the base that we added from the burette will be consumed, leaving us with just 2.50 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of hydrofluoric acid at equilibrium. <clears throat> and once again, we're going to ignore water, but yeah, that we created 2.50 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of water, um, but we're never going to really look at water for the mass action expression. So here we're going to go ahead and put in 2.50 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of fluoride. And... I'm just going to duplicate this, okay, and this is going to be F minus. <clears throat> now, once again, we're trying to solve for the pH, and the pH is dictated by the concentration of H plus at equilibrium, or we can calculate it from the concentration of hydroxide at equilibrium. Once again, if you look at the species, the chemical species that we have at equilibrium, it's neither um, H plus or, F, uh, or OH minus. What we have is a weak acid and it's conjugate base. So when you have both of these two together in the same solution, once again, you guys create a buffer. And whenever you guys uh, have a buffer, you can calculate the pH using the henderson hasselbalch equation. And so the conjugate base is going to go at the very top. So this F minus is going to be in the numerator. So 2.50 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. And uh, this uh, 2.53 times 10 to the negative 3 moles for the weak acid goes in the denominator. And so earlier, I, I told you that uh, for this specific type of calculation, whenever you guys are trying to determine the pH, when the volume of the titrant is exactly half the volume needed to reach the equivalence point, this is a very, very specific scenario for weak acid, strong base titration. Um, this is a scenario when the number of moles of the conjugate base is equal to the moles of the weak acid. 
Therefore, they're going to cancel each other out. So log of 1 is equal to 0. So what you have is pH is equal to the pKa. Um, you can say log of uh, pH is equal to pKa plus 0, right? Because that's what log of 1 equals to. But at that point, you don't really need to show it. And so since the pH is equal to the pKa, when you are at half equivalence point, all you have to do is take the, pK, uh, the negative log of the Ka, and that's your pH, right? And so the Ka, if I look back at the previous problem, so the Ka is 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4, and then the negative log of it is 3.14. And so when you are exactly at half equivalence point, your pKa is equal to your pH. Okay? So I'll show my work over here. When you are at half equivalence point, for the titration of a strong base to weak acid. Okay. You will always use this equation. Okay, pH is equal to pKa. And so if my um, Ka is 7.4 times 10 to the negative 4. I'm going to take the negative log of that, and that's going to give me my pH. And so this is going to be my pH when the volume of the base, or the titrant, is equal to 12.50 milliliters. And so you can see how there are stark differences between the calculation of strong acid, strong base, strong base, strong acid, to that of um, if your analyte is a weak acid, okay, and if your titrant is a strong base. There's huge differences in calculations. Uh, all of these calculations individually, you guys know how to do. Um, however, putting it together is what makes these types of problems challenging. Um, but they're, they're really good at th these examples, these, this exercise is really good at pulling all of this um, cumulative knowledge, these individual pieces of knowledge together. Okay. All right. And so now that we've finished um, part C, we're going to go ahead and look at the question for part D. And we're going to see how we can calculate that. All right. So the next thing that we need to do is to calculate the pH of the analyte when the equivalence point is reached. Um, and remember, you always need two pieces to uh, determine the point in the titration curve. You need the pH, which is you know what we're solving for, and you also need the volume of the titrant. And the volume of the titrant is a base in this case. If you guys read the problem, part D, it didn't tell us either information. However, we know we're at equivalence point. And so at equivalence point, we can use that, uh, that equation MA times VA is equal to MB times VB divided by the coefficients in, divided by their coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly copy and paste uh, this work because I've, I've kind of already done it here in part C. And so I'm going to take this, the, the VB, the equivalence point. Okay. Actually, I should just copy the picture as well. That's okay. I'm going to paste it onto this area uh, just to showcase my work. 
And so the volume of the base at equivalence point is 25.00 milliliters. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and copy this image one more time. Just so I know my starting materials. I know the concentration and the volume that I'm, I'm working with uh, for each substance. <clears throat> All right. So now that I've figured out the volume of the base, which is 25 milliliters, once again using this dilution, this modified version of dilution equation, now I need to figure out the pH of the solution. So there's another difference between strong uh, base strong acid titration and strong base uh, weak acid titration. And the difference comes from the equivalence point. Now, uh, in strong acid, strong base, or strong base, strong acid, the equivalence point was always seven because both uh, the strong, because both acid and base are strong acid, strong bases, such that their anions do not affect the pH of the solution, right? Um, and so if you think about hydrochloric acid, the chloride is the anion of the strong acid HCl. And so when it ionizes, that Cl doesn't go back, it doesn't act as a base, it doesn't ionize a hydrogen from a water molecule, it just stays floating, right? It wants to be a Cl minus, it doesn't want to be an HCl. Because remember, HCl is a strong acid, so it ionizes in one direction. Um, and so this, is, this point is very important for me to harp on because the calculation is uh, indicative of the nature of these chemical compounds. Okay. And so once again, I am going to um, summarize what's happening in this chemical reaction. So here we're taking 25 mils and we're putting it in this Erlenmeyer flask. And the amount of base and the amount of acid that I'm going to put in, they're going to react. And so since there's going to be a reaction that's occurring between the base and the acid, I need to write another chemical equation. And it's the same chemical equation that we've kind of discussed in previous sections of this problem. Now, um, since a chemical reaction is occurring between acid and base, I know that I need to write my ice table to showcase um, how, um, how do I say this? To showcase the progress of the chemical reaction uh, when it goes from initial to equilibrium. And so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, create this ice table And so since liquid is, uh, since water is liquid, we're just going to go ahead and completely ignore that. Another modification I'm going to do is I'm going to erase that sodium. Uh, sodium is a spectator ion, so the cation of a strong base does not affect the pH of the solution. And sodium is a cation of a strong base. And uh, once again, since a reaction is occurring, I'm going to go ahead and figure out the number of moles by multiplying the volume of the concentration. So for HF, I already have it here, this guy doesn't change, it's going to be 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Now for the hydroxide, that value is going to be different than the previous two problems because I've increased my volume, so I should have more moles. And so if I take uh, the liters, so I'm going to take 0 0.025 liters and multiply that by 0.2, that's going to get me 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Okay, So I'm going to multiply these together. But I need to make sure that this 25 mils is expressed in liters. Okay, 
that's how I got my 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3. Now, if you guys look at this uh, specific reaction, notice that we have equal moles of uh, weak acid okay, to equal moles of our strong base. And so if this is like a battlefield between acids and bases, since they're both equal to each other, they're going to cancel each other out. Um, and so it doesn't matter. So we don't actually have a winner. We, we, we just have something that's neutral, right? Uh, which makes sense because this is at equivalence point. And uh, this is a canonical acid-base neutralization reaction. Um, and we will produce, you know, positive 5.00 times 10 to negative 3 moles of water, but we don't really care about water. Um, here, we're going to put positive 5.00 times 10 to negative 3 moles of F minus. And so at equilibrium, I have no more weak acid. Okay? Here at equilibrium, um, I have no more strong base. The only thing that I have at equilibrium is F minus, which its mole value is going to be 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3. And so how can I calculate the pH um, if I only have F minus? Because if you recall, F minus is, I'm sorry, if you recall the pH is calculated by either the concentration of the acid or the concentration of the hydroxide ion at equilibrium. Okay, and so if I don't have um, H plus or OH minus at equilibrium, and if I only have F minus, how can I calculate the pH of the solution? Okay, now if you guys are thinking about Henderson Hasselbalch equation, you guys cannot use the Henderson Hasselbalch equation because you only have the conjugate base left. There is no more weak acid. And so this um, buffer system has been completely overwhelmed or been neutralized, so to speak, so that you only have the conjugate base remaining. And so uh, to determine the pH of this um, to determine the pH of the solution, we need to think about how fluoride is reacting or, or how fluoride is acting in, in the solution, right? Notice that we're, we're converting everything to, H, to F minus. Um, but F minus is a weak base. Okay. And we know that um, this weak base a certain fraction of it will react with the water to reform some of the reactants that was consumed in the forward direction. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to represent how much of the weak base has gone back and reacted with its second product, which is, I'm sorry, it's, it's reactant, it's water, how much of F minus is reacting with water to reproduce the hydroxide and the F minus, and the, and the HF, the, the weak acid. Okay, and we're going to go ahead and represent that with another ice table. And so F minus is going to ionize some fraction, a small amount, a very small amount of this 5.0 times 10 to negative 3 moles is going to go backwards. It's going to reform the OH minus and the HF. Okay. And so what you get is HF plus OH minus. And here in this case, okay. <clears throat> um, in this case, I'm actually going to convert this into molarity. 
Uh, the reason why is because there's no, no acid base reaction. No acid base reaction. Okay. So no acid base reaction, use molarity. Acid base reaction, use moles. Okay. And so I'm going to take this uh, 5.00 times 10 to negative 3 moles. And I'm going to convert it into concentration. And to do that, I need to figure out the total volume. So 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles divide this by the total volume of the solution. And I can get that volume by taking, by adding how much I added to how much is already present. And so in this case, it's going to be 50 mils. So here I have a 50 milliliter solution, so 0 0.050 um, liters. And so if I divide my answer to that of 0 0.05, my molar concentration for F minus is going to be 0 0.100. And so if you have 0 0.100 molar <clears throat> concentration of F minus, remember that F minus is a weak base. And so therefore, we don't know how much of that 0 0.100 molar or that 5 times 0, 4, 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of F minus is actually going to ionize in the reverse direction. In this case, we don't know how much of it is going to react with water to form HF and OH. And so we know that you know some amount of water is going to be consumed, but we don't take this into consideration for the mass action expression. And uh, remember that for the initial, we have no HF and no OH minus. And so then we're going to just say that this is plus x, plus x, and nothing and nothing here. And so what you guys point 0.100 0, 0 minus x, plus x, and plus x. And you can go ahead and build a mass action expression such that hf times oh over f minus is equal to an equilibrium constant. Okay, and um, let's think about what we're trying to do here. We're trying to, once again, figure out the pH of the solution. And the pH can only be defined by either the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen ion or that of the hydroxide. Well, if you look, we have the hydroxide. We just don't know how much of it we have. <clears throat> and so this is going <laughs> to invite me to... Um, to think about my mass action expression and solving for x, very similar, to, very similar to what you guys have done for monoprotic acids, monoprotic bases. <clears throat> now, in this scenario, notice that I have a weak base. And in the forward direction, it's describing the ionization of the weak base. So this must be Kb. Okay, So this must be Kb and not Ka. Now, the only um, equilibrium, let me see here, the only ionization constant that was given to me was Ka. And so you guys have to convert Ka into Kb. Okay. And so to do that, we're going to take Ka times Kb is equal to Kw. And we're going to assume at 25 degrees Celsius, it's 1.008 times 10 to the negative 14. And so Kb is, being, uh, is equal to that Kw uh, divided by Ka. And the value for Ka was 7.4 times 10 to the negative 4. So therefore, the Kb value, okay, so 1.008 times 10 to the negative 14, divide this by uh, 7.4 times 10 to the negative 4. Okay. 
So that KB value is going to be 1.4 times 10 to the negative 11. So I'm keeping two sig figs. Okay. So here I have 1.4 times 10 to the negative 11, which equals to the equilibrium amounts, x, x, and this guy. And so this is going to be x times x over 0 0.100 minus x. And so um, this is going to combine to form x squared over 0 0.100. And uh, if you look at the KB values times 10 to negative 11, and so I am going to ignore this uh, bottom X to make sure that I don't encounter a quadratic equation. Um, and so this 1.4 times 10 to negative 11 is going to just carry down. And if I multiply it over um, by 0.1, I'm going to get the same value. However, it's going to be times 10 to the negative 12 and that's going to be equal to x squared. So I'm going to square root both sides. And if I square root my answer, I'm simply going to get 1.1 times 10 to the negative 6. And that's my value for x. Now let's think about the concept. Uh, what does x represent? x represents many things in this ice table, but it uh, for the relevance, for what we're trying to solve for, we are solving for the concentration of hydroxide. Okay, so if X represents hydroxide, uh, in addition to other things, um, we're going to say that the concentration of hydroxide at equilibrium after the fluoride ion has... Uh, you know, kind of settled down and reach its own equilibrium when it was after it's been made from the acid base reaction, it's going to be 1.1 times 10 to negative 6. And for me, it's just easier for me personally to just convert this to pOH because all I have to do is take the negative log of whatever I have in my answer. And, um, and I'm going to report to the correct number of sig figs. And so the negative log of 1.1 times 10 to the negative 6 is going to be 5.93. Okay. And so 5.93 is not going to be my final answer because once again, my question is asking what is the pH of this solution? And so to uh, get from pH to, um, to get to pH, I have to do pH plus pOH is equal to 14. And so I'm going to take 14 minus my answer, and that's going to be 8.07. Okay. And so it turns out that my pH, because remember in strong base, strong acid, at equivalence point, the pH was 7. And so when you guys are doing a strong base to weak acid, the pH is not 7. It's always going to be greater than 7 for weak base, um, for a strong base weak acid titration. Because at equilibrium, this F- minus is going to produce just a little bit more OH than expected, right? So here we have that initial reaction where the acid neutralized this base. However, when it does so, it produces a weak base. And this weak base can go ahead and some fraction, not all of it, only a small amount will react with water to, pro to reproduce this hydroxide. And it is this hydroxide that's going to um, dominate the, the um, pH of the solution, if you will. And so since I have more hydroxide, it makes sense that our pH is more basic at equivalence point. And so this is a huge difference compared to um, strong acid, strong base, or strong base, strong acid titration, where the pH at equivalence point is exactly at 7. Okay, Because 
the anions that is produced in a strong acid, strong base hydration, they do not affect the pH of the solution. Okay. So hopefully um, you guys understood that concept. And so the pH is 8.07 when VB is equal to 25.00 milliliters. So remember this is at equivalence point. And so uh, this level of calculation, it's, it's, it's complex. However, um, it's possible. You just have to think about the concept, think about the reaction. It is the reaction, the nature of the reaction that drives your calculation. And that's how it always is for Chem 115, second semester of general chemistry. All right, so let's go ahead and do part E. And then we're going to go ahead and graph all of our results to conclude this problem. Okay. And so before I start, um, one more item. I just need to copy this image. Um, don't move it. I just need you to copy it. I'm going to go ahead and erase some stuff here just to kind of reset the scenario. Okay. I don't think I'm going to erase that because um, that's pretty consistent. All right, so we're going to calculate the pH of the analyte, once again, pH, um, when we add 35 mils of titrant. And so if you recall, the volume uh, required to reach the equivalence point was at 25 mils. And so if we're adding 35 mils, we're past the equivalence point. Okay? So in each, each and every single one of these problems, these sub-problems, if you will, for us to be able to sketch the, the titration curve, we're going to treat them as if we're like restarting the titration. We're starting from zero. We're starting from scratch. Um, now, in reality, this is additive, it's summative, um, but since we're doing these calculations, paper chemistry, we're just going to go ahead and go back to the original um, scenario. All right, so here in this case, we're going to add 35 mils of sodium hydroxide, with a tight, um, and we're going to determine the pH um, when that amount is added. And once again, here we have a base. We're adding a base to an acid. Okay. And whenever we're performing an acid-base reaction, we need to write the chemical equation. So here we have HF plus sodium hydroxide to produce water and um, sodium fluoride. And I'm going to go ahead and modify this equation to exclude any spectator ions or ions that do not affect the pH of the solution. Okay. And so overall, this is going to be OH minus and F minus. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about the initial change and equilibrium. Oops. Oops. And so remember the main goal is for us to determine the pH of the solution. And so for us to determine the pH of the solution, I need to know the equilibrium concentrations of either hydrogen ion or hydroxide ion. Okay. And since we're performing an acid-base reaction, okay, we're going to go ahead and convert everything in terms of moles. Okay. 
so there's two different ways, once again, to set up your initial amounts for these titration curves. Um, molarity or, or moles. And so if it's an acid-base reaction, then uh, I personally just do it in moles. If you're just uh, allowing something to ionize, there's no reaction, there's no like real acid-base reaction that's occurring, you guys can go ahead and express it in terms of molarity. Um, all right, and so uh, we're going to go ahead and look at this uh, calculation, and we're going to go ahead and do so by determining the number of moles of each component. So once again, we're going to go ahead and multiply these values, make sure that you guys convert milliliters to liters, and that will give us 5.00 times 10 to negative 3 moles of acid. So 5.00 times 10 to negative 3 moles of our HF. And so uh, what we're going to do is calculate the number of moles of hydroxide that we're adding into the solution. And so we're going to take 0 0.035. So I converted 35 mils into liters. Okay, Make sure you guys do that. So I have 0 0.03500 liters times this by 0 0.200 molar, okay, moles per liter. So multiply that by 0.2, and that's going to give me 7.0 um, times 10 to the negative 3. Okay. So I have 7.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of my hydroxide. Once again, uh, think about this acid-base reaction, kind of like a battlefield. Um, who do you think the winner will be? Okay. And if you said hydroxide, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the number of moles of HF is small, so that's our limiting reactant. And that, and, uh, in an acid-base reaction, that means all of it will be consumed. And so at equilibrium, we have no more uh, weak acid. However, we have 2.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of our hydroxide. And we do have 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of fluoride. And so remember what we're trying to do here, we're trying to determine the pH of the solution. And so we either need the equilibrium concentration of H plus or the equilibrium concentration of OH minus. Now, if you guys look at uh, our substance, we do have OH minus and we have the equilibrium amount. However, it's in mole unit. Um, now, for those, uh, so for some of you guys, you, you might see this as like, okay, wait, Raimundo, you told us in the previous problem that F minus can go back in reverse. Yes, that's absolutely true. F minus can go back in reverse. And so technically speaking, if you want to be precise with and, and accurate with how many moles of OH that's actually being produced, you'll go, you're going to go ahead and do um, a second ice table. Um, and you're going to make sure that this OH minus is included as your initial amount because that's how much there is present. However, you will see that when you make that second ice table, it's kind of like a polyprotic acid. It's like the second ice table of a polyprotic acid, polyprotic base. Um, your, uh, uh, the amount of hydroxide that's produced by the reverse reaction from this conjugate base is going to equal to a value that's much, much, much smaller than what you currently have. And so uh, what you currently have is enough to calculate the pH without having to do the second ice table. Okay. 
And so feel free to work out that calculation. Um, and you should see that the resulting value should not alter the, the pH too much if you take into consideration the amount of hydroxide that's being produced in the reverse reaction from F minus. Okay. Now, uh, let's go ahead and complete this problem. And so if the concentration of OH minus is 2.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles, we need to convert this into molarity by dividing it by the total volume. And so the total volume is going to be the sum of 35 and 25. So we have 60 milliliters. So the total volume is 60.00 milliliters, and therefore the value in liters is going to be 0 0.0600 and one more zero liters. Now, now that I have moles per liter, I'm going to go ahead and divide those two values. So 2.00 times 10 to the negative 3. Divide this by 0 0.06, and a whole bunch of zeros. So the molar concentration of this hydroxide is going to be 0.33, oops, 3.33, and a whole bunch of threes actually, times 10 to the negative 2. So 3 to infinity. Okay. And so I can go ahead and calculate my pOH. And my pOH is just going to be the negative log of my answer. And so uh, I have three sig figs. Let me highlight the number of sig figs. Okay, so there's three sig figs here. There's four sig figs there. So I need three sig figs in my final answer. Uh, when I take my pOH, that's going to represent four place, uh, three places after the decimal. So it's going to be 1.477. Okay. Now, um, remember, pH is what I want to solve for. So I'm going to take 14 minus 1.4. 77 seven. and that answer is going to be 12.523 okay so once again I have three sig figs three decimal places three decimal places and so my final answer is that when the volume of the base that was added, which is 35.00 milliliters, my pH is equal to 12.523. Okay. And I'll, now I have my last point for my titration curve. All right. And so now that I have all of my points um, that I need to build my titration curve, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go ahead and draw a rough sketch. And so since I know that pH is going to be on my y-axis, it's going to be 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, two, and then one, and then zero. Okay. So I'm just using the lines that's already present on my um, paper, my digital paper, to represent the pH values. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and so I'm going to go ahead and put in part A, B, C, D, and E. And so in this example, I actually have five points, not four points. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and maybe I'll work from the bottom up. So I have 30. So if my VB is equal to 35 mils, my pH is 12.523. Okay. And then when my VB is 25, I have 8.07. Okay. Okay. 
and D is going to mark my equivalence point. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, maybe I'll highlight this in yellow to remind me that this is my equivalence point. And so C is when I have that halfway mark, and it was 12.50 milliliters. So I'm going to scroll up to part C. Um, and so here, when my volume of the base is 12.5 milliliters, I have a pH of 3.14. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll back down. 3. Point, um, oh, geez, I really did forget. 3.14. Okay, so for part B, 2.97 and 10 mils. Erase this. Okay. And last but not least, when my volume is zero, when I didn't put any titrant, my pH is 1.92. All right, so now that I have all of my points, it looks like my range for my x-axis, which is the volume of the titrant, so this is VB, is going to be from 0 to 35. So I'll just go ahead and um, maybe I'll do it in, in terms of 2 so I can expand my graph. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, and 36. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and plot the first point, 0 and 1.92. And so 0 and 1.92, that's uh, above, uh, just right underneath uh, the 2. Okay, so this is A. So for B, I have 10 mils and 2.97. So 10 mils is right here. Okay. So I'm just going to draw up and 2.97 is right underneath 3 so I'm just going to go ahead and put a B to mark that that's my result for that part part C is going to be 12.5 and 3.14 so 12.5 is probably closer to 12 uh oh okay so this is just an estimate here um, on your exam, I will definitely give you guys graph paper. And so this is going to be C and it's 3.14. Okay. So 3.14 is just slightly above 3. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and erase this point. Now D is going to be 25 mils. So that's somewhere in the middle. And my pH is 8.07. And so 8.07, uh, that's right above 8, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and mark this as yellow to represent my um, equivalence point. And last but not least, I have 35 and 12.523. So 35 mils is right in the middle. And 12.53. So that's going to be right around here. Okay, So this is going to be... C, D, 
and E. All right. So when you guys are creating this titration curve, remember that as you approach the equivalence point, the titration curve is going to start curving upwards. Okay. Let me just be a little exact here. So this is supposed to curve, oops. Let me zoom in. And so notice I have like three points that's almost in line. Um, okay, uh, if I had two points, it's gonna be like this almost, right? Uh, I just need one more point. I should, I should have you guys calculate one more point above, um, but that's okay. And so when I'm drawing my titration curve, as I approach D, I'm gonna go ahead and curve And so this is going to be my titration curve for my uh, weak acid to that of a strong base, such that the equivalence point has a pH greater than 7. And that's something that's characteristic about a strong base weak acid titration curves. And I'm going to go ahead and talk about that in the next video. Um, cool. So this is kind of a long video. I apologize. There's just so many steps. Um, as you guys can attest if you watch this whole entire video. Um, so I do expect that you guys uh, are, a I do expect that you guys are able to calculate, um, you know, the pH of the solution when X amount of titrant is added. And so feel free to, you know, watch this video again if you didn't take notes um, or just maybe you know rewind this video just go back to the parts uh, where it has all the questions and do it on your own and then um, go ahead and play this video again just to check out your answers i do encourage you guys to do uh, a weak base I'm sorry, a strong acid as your titrant. To a weak base as your analyte. Uh, the calculations are very similar to what I went over this video. Um, what I went over in this video. However, the components, like the, the chemical reactions are different. But you know the applying the ice table, applying uh, the MAVA over uh, equals to MA, M, MBVB, um, and all of that stuff still applies. The only thing that's different is that you have a weak base as your analyte instead of a weak acid. Okay. And I'll go ahead and flash uh, an example problem in the next video, and I'll go ahead and give you the final answers. Um, and uh, you guys are just going to have to follow this work that I did on this video to help you determine how to, how, how to solve the pH at each point of the addition of the titrant. Okay. All right. So that's pretty much um, it for this video. In the next video, I'm going to compare and contrast the titration curves, the four um, titration curves, and... Uh, give you guys that sample problem for um, a strong acid weak base titration. All right, see you guys in the next video.